when architect and engineer are passionate about a shared ideal, when they can courageously but respectfully explore and test each other's limits. The result can be a masterpiece. It is this willing, energetic partnership that stretches technology's boundaries and forges bold ideas into reality. The fruit of that collaboration can make people's lives better, a useful, helpful, beautiful creation to enrich the life of a society. I know this, that this business of getting various people to pull together and integrating, uh, you know, the designs or integrating, um, getting people to act harmonious together, for, for that, is a very difficult one and it is psychological and political. Engineering has a reputation for being pragmatic, precise and rational, but it is also fundamentally intuitive. Early in a design, engineering intuition is a key element in sifting through an infinite range of possibilities. It lets us pass through the barriers we build with reason, habit and language, helping us to notice parallels and relationships. That is uh, something which, of course, engineers have always realised. Engineers contribute to the design of structures that make life better for people. Roads, bridges and buildings ideally do more than just work efficiently. They should be integrated into the whole so that they can be appreciated on a sublime level as well. Put simply, a roof can do more than just keep the rain out. There is an enormous amount that people can do about the environment. And an architect must see that his part is part of the town planning of the whole environment. And town planning is a way of planning one's life at the same time, and that could leads into the, the, you know, the aims and what what should we aim at, what, how should we live, and all that kind of thing, you see. So that building is, in a, in a way, in a sort of central position. On the one side, it, it, it uh, connects up to, it's applied science, to all the science, all the techniques, all the mastering nature, and all that sort of thing. To the other side, it comes to, to be integration with all the other uh, people who are concerned with building, to create an environment, a town, a country, the kind of life you want to live, philosophy, religion, a lot. A classic example of this creative process in the modern era was built here on the foreshores of Sydney Harbour. The lyrical drawings of the architect Jörnutzen showed two amphitheatres side by side, topped with floating sails. Engineer Ove Arup was convinced it could be done in keeping with the spirit of the architect's original ideas. The free-form shapes of the roof needed a geometric discipline in order to be built. The engineering team studied a host of options. All the pieces for the main shells could be cut from the surface of a single ellipsoid, which meant that the ribs would be identical. This offered enormous simplicity in fabrication. Architect Jörn Utzen selected the spherical approach. The final look of the world-famous building was set. The engineers developed a system of pre-casting the pieces of the shell in a purpose-built factory on site. This technique, which was at the forefront of contemporary building technology, made it possible for the engineers to give substance to the architect's vision of perfection. The engineers harnessed the latest and best of available technologies at the time. Three state-of-the-art computers were used for a total of 1,800 hours. In this, and many other ways, the project stretched the outer limits of what was then possible. Almost every aspect of this extraordinary project was beyond the experience of the architects and the engineers of the day. I mean, this, well, everything is unusual. The site is unusual. The method of um, paying for this opera house by lottery is unusual. And um, uh, as I said, the architect, the clients are unusual because I've, I've never met I mean, they're very understanding. They all want to, cre to help to create this masterpiece. And, uh, and I say the architect because he is, uh, I think he's a very unusual architect. Uh, he's very gifted. He's very, 
good sense of space, very quick in the uptake. And he sort of goes to the to the bottom of things. I mean, oh, he, he has got a very good sense of all the architectural, um, what should I say, the bricks with which you make architects, I mean, color and, 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 and form and so on. He's, he, he really knows how it affects people. He has got very strong views on that without having any particular style or anything like that. You know, there, there are no, he's completely open to any kind of suggestion, but he's very uh, determined to have it right to have what he thinks is right, you see. I mean, he, he will not compromise very easily. And he will go to, he will, if I say, well, of course, if you do that, this will take six months longer, it will cost more than said, all right, it must take six months longer. They, they can wait for this house. This house, there won't be another half house built like that for the next hundred years, so I mean, what, six months, you know. That's a sort of more or less his attitude. He'd, he'd rather go on working six months more than, than have it not as a good. Now that, in, enormous sense of form and space and, and, and of color and texture of this thing. And that great simplicity, you see, that mustn't be spoiled. And in fact, you have an extremely complicated thing. Now, to make a very complicated thing look very simple, that is much more difficult to, than to make a simple thing look complicated, which lots of people can do. But uh, and, and that has really been the main task of that house, apart from these rather striking structural things, which are fantastically difficult and, and something that's never been attempted to before. This gigantic project caused considerable stir around Australia. It was described as an engineer's folly, a tour de farce, and an unmitigated bitch to build. Critics claimed the enormous amount of money being spent on it should have gone to feeding the hungry. O'Varrop was one of the project's most passionate defenders. I don't hold with the view that you can, as long as there's anybody in the world uh, uh, starving or not having a house, you are not allowed to build a theatre or a monument or a thing like that. I mean, it's, it's going too far, you see, because you can't do that. And people need that kind of thing. They need a bit of uplift and they need of, uh, inspiration and they need, need something. And if you can build something which is good and which is marvelous and which is a monument for all that, uh, you're doing more than just building this thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing to have a sort of example of perfection of, of something grand and big which will be cla classified as one of the great buildings in the world. The building stands as a remarkable monument to the creative partnership of engineer and architect, art and science, mind and machine. The mission, he says, is to make life better. There can be a difficulty about uh, a society getting the environment it ought to have because it doesn't know how to get it and it can't create it. And the architect must tell them. Mutual trust, intuition, a sense of purpose, and above all, courage. These qualities contribute to enduring works of art by architects and engineers. When the partners come together with these qualities at the forefront of their minds, they can create wonders out of mere bricks and mortar.